If you're ever going to defuse a bomb, be very careful. I've had a lot of experience in bomb defusing, at least from what I've seen on TV and the movies. So that pretty much makes me an expert on bomb defusal. So if there's ever a bomb that you need to defuse, which wire do you cut? Steady. You can do this. All you gotta do is remember the song you learned in bomb school. Green is good, and green is good, and red is good, and yellow is good, and clip whatever you want. Now there are always coloured wires. The trick is knowing which one to cut. You'd think that people who make the bombs in the movies would catch on and make all the wires black. But which coloured wire do you cut? Cut the correct wire and the bomb is diffused. Cut the wrong wire and the clock accelerates and the timer speeds up closer and closer to your impending doom. I'm cutting the wire. Snip. Roger. Actually, I've recently been educated on bomb defusal through some educational movies. It seems that bombs these days are even more sophisticated. Any tampering at all, cut any wire and the bomb will go off. Disconnect the phone, boom. Move the bomb, boom. There ain't nothing gonna stop that bomb from exploding. But like that song, nothing's gonna stop us now. Nothing is gonna get in the way of that bomb exploding according to today's movies. Now, let's hope our days of bombs in Northern Ireland are well over and never to return. However, the point is, there are some things you simply can't stop. You can't stop that bomb from going off. You can't stop the sun from rising. You can't stop the seasons from coming. And here's the point of today's message. You can't stop the Lord from doing what he's going to do. You can't derail him. When he plans to do something, it's going to be done. And ain't nothing going to stop him. Now, that's great news for us. Firstly, because if someone was able to stop God and his plan for Jesus to die, then we'd have a grim future ahead of us. But also because God has great plans for you. Great plans for you. Now, there's a verse in Jeremiah that's always taken out of context, so I'm not going to use that verse. But Paul writes, for example, in Ephesians 1, that we have an inheritance waiting for us, that the Holy Spirit is a deposit of that inheritance, a taster of what's to come. God has plans to be with us, to never leave us, to make us more like Jesus, to save us, to heal us. Ever feel confused about the events in your life? Why things are happening the way they're happening? Why things have happened the way they've happened? Why things aren't happening the way you think they should happen. Today's message is for you. It's for everyone, really. So let me say it again. Nothing can stop the Lord from doing what he's going to do. Which means that whatever God has planned for you, he will do. And nothing and no one can stand in his way, even if they try. Whatever God has planned to do, nothing and no one can stop him. And we see this in black and white in our passage today. God planned to send his son to earth to redeem many people, to start the process of reversing the effects of sin. And nothing or nobody was going to stop that, no matter how hard they tried. And people did try. But like cutting the wire in that bomb, the harder they tried, all that served to do is accelerate God's plans. Let's back up a little for a second and ask this question. What was the purpose for Jesus coming to earth? Among other things, his purpose was to die, to pay the punishment for our sin. Okay, so since there are many different ways to die, could Jesus have died in any way? For example, could he have tripped over a rock and fallen off a cliff? Would that have paid the price for our sin? I mean, yeah, he could have died from falling off a cliff, but how would that have helped us in our sinful state? Could he have been murdered? Well, yeah, but how would that have helped us in our sinful state? 
See, the way I see it, Jesus had to face a death sentence. He had to be executed because that's what our sin deserved. We were under a death sentence. We were going to be executed for our sin, eternal death. Jesus had to face it in the same way. Jesus had to step in for us and die in our place. And so no other way would work. Now, the Old Testament prophets spoke of Jesus being pierced, spoke of someone being cursed when hanging on a tree. So back then, if these prophecies were to be true and fulfilled, Jesus would have to have died and be executed by crucifixion. But if Jesus had to be executed by crucifixion, we have a problem. Because execution was for a criminal. And Jesus wasn't a criminal. Jesus did no wrong. So what do you do if you want to get someone executed, but they've done nothing wrong? Well... You have to make something up about them, don't you? And that's what the Jewish leaders did. In verse 59 of our passage, it says, The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. The Jewish leaders were out for blood because Jesus, who claimed to be a Jew and was in fact the perfect Jew, Jesus was gaining lots of followers and teaching stuff about grace and love and the real meaning of the Old Testament which made them look bad because they had lost their way. The Jewish leaders had got caught up in tradition and traditionalism, doing things because this is the way we've always done them and because it looks good, doing all that rather than worshipping and loving God and their neighbour. And so these guys were starting to lose control and would have lost control if this was going to go on any longer. And so the solution to their problem is to put a stop to Jesus. This man, Jesus, had to die. And ironically, even though these Jewish leaders were supposed to follow God's laws, they set out to kill an innocent man. But even more ironically, despite the fact that they were breaking a ton of God's laws, they weren't going to murder him in cold blood. Oh no, no, no. In order to appease their consciences, they had to find something that would allow them to kill Jesus legally so that they could feel good about themselves. I haven't murdered anyone, haven't sinned at all. However, since Jesus was perfect and never sinned, it was going to be hard to find anything to stick. So the chief priests and all of the Jewish bigwigs looked for false statements against Jesus. These are the religious leaders blatantly breaking the commandments they held so dear in order to get Jesus killed. This is how much they hated him. They wanted to stop this movement of Jesus and they would do anything to stop it, even break their own rules and hurt the God they claim to love and follow. The irony is that they thought that getting Jesus executed would scupper his plans. They thought that killing Jesus would stop this Jesus movement, when all along that was God's plan, and their actions only served to accelerate it. Don't forget, nothing and no one can stop God from doing what he's going to do. But when all that failed, There were two people who had an accusation that matched. Don't forget, for an accusation to be credible, it had to come from two separate sources and it had to be the same story. So someone comes up and declares, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days, which is a misquote. What Jesus actually says is, if you destroy this temple, meaning if you kill me, I will rebuild it again in three days, meaning he'd rise from the dead in three days after he was killed, which he did. Anyway, this accusation was enough to make the high priest push further and ask Jesus if he is the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replies with a verse from Daniel. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Which basically means he told them he was equal with God. God himself, and would sit at God's right hand. Now, this was enough for the Jewish leaders to be satisfied that they can, in good conscience, whatever that means, put Jesus to death. They can kill him and feel good that they haven't done anything wrong. Problem is, they don't have the power to put anyone to death. Jerusalem is occupied by Rome, who call the shots. They're the ones who decides who lives or dies. And if they take this accusation that Jesus is the Messiah to the Roman leaders, they'll laugh it off. They don't care about 
who or who isn't a messiah or who calls himself a messiah. It's like going to the police and telling them or asking them to arrest your husband because he annoys you. Now, no matter how annoying your husband might be, the police don't care about that. No, what the Jewish leaders needed was something that would be enough for the Romans to kill Jesus. And so they can't go to them with an accusation about Jesus being the Messiah or calling himself the Messiah. So what they do is they change the accusation from something religious, which the Romans wouldn't care about, to something political, which they would care about. So off they go to Pilate and accuse Jesus of calling himself a king. Now we need to go to Luke to see this. In Luke 23 verse 2 it says, And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payments of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. Now do you see the change there from claiming to be the anointed one of God, which the Romans wouldn't give two hoots about, to this man is subverting our nation. He's opposing tax payment. He claims to be a king, which is not what Messiah means. Now, was this going to be enough for Pilate to sentence Jesus to death? Well, Pilate didn't find anything in this man that would incite violence. This wasn't some guy who was going to be overthrowing Rome or trying to overthrow Rome. And so in order to appease his own conscience, I'm not going to put this innocent man to death, he brings Jesus out to the crowd to let them decide. But once again, nothing and no one can stop God from doing what he's going to do. Jesus had to die. It was going to happen. So even Pilate's merciful act wasn't going to work because God's going to do what he's going to do. And the crowd choose Barabbas. What's interesting is his name. Here we have the gospel in a nutshell. Jesus Christ is up against Jesus Barabbas. Two Jesuses, one innocent, one guilty. Barabbas means son of the father. Not a very original name. Could be describing literally anyone. However, Jesus Christ is the son of the father, the son of the heavenly father. And so it is the son of the father, the innocent man, who dies in place of the guilty. The guilty going free. Charges dropped and the innocent dying in their place. So the Jewish leaders wanted to stop this Jesus movement. If they could kill Jesus, then everything would be put to an end. We'd be done with all of this. What they didn't realise is that that is God's plan all along, that Jesus would die. What the Jewish leaders did was accelerate God's plan. They cut the wrong wire. Their actions did the opposite of what they planned. Pilate might have let them go, but that would have scuppered God's plans. But nothing can scupper God's plans. And so God didn't let that happen either. Instead, the crowd chose Barabbas and Jesus is sent off to be crucified, even though Pilate thought he was innocent. And so off Jesus goes to be executed. The innocent man dying in place of the guilty. But I'm not talking about him dying in place of Barabbas. I'm talking about Jesus dying in place of you and me. That was God's plan. To offer a way out, to offer forgiveness, to offer redemption. And nothing and no one can stop God from doing what he's going to do. Do you see that in action in this story today? Even though the people did what they did, their actions were all under God's sovereign plan. And his plan was fulfilled. It's always going to be fulfilled. Now, it's critical that we don't just see this in Jesus' life. It's critical that we see it in our lives too. Like I said earlier, God has a great plan for each of your lives. We don't know what that plan is, but we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So if we're followers of Jesus, we do know that God's plan is for our good. We've talked about this before. So let's live our lives in the knowledge of that. Let's live each and every day in the knowledge that whatever is happening to you or around you, all these things are happening under the control of God, within his sovereign plan for you. And as a follower of Jesus, called according to his purposes, all these things are for your good. And nothing and no one can stop God from doing what he's going to do. 
Even if bad things happen to us or around us, those things might be serving to accelerate his good plans for you. The bad things or the tragedy in your life could be the equivalent of cutting the wrong wire and accelerating the fulfilment of God's good plan for you. I was talking to someone this week who had an experience like this. And it's not the first time I've heard a story like this, but someone had to go to hospital for whatever reason. Maybe they had an accident or something. But in the course of the investigation, the scans have picked up something else, like a small tumour or something like that. And it's caught early and easily fixed because it was picked up in those scans, which were for something completely unrelated. And so the accident, which could be considered bad, turns out to accelerate the good in that the cancer was detected early and removed quickly and easily. But even if things don't work out that way, because let's face it, some people do die. In fact, everybody dies. It's one of those things that you can't stop. So if things don't work out as nice as that example, remember that the ultimate good for everyone who loves Jesus is to be with him. Healing happens in heaven. Perfect healing. Freedom from pain happens in heaven. So if you're praying for the healing of a loved one who is a believer and they die, they have been healed. God has accelerated the good thing that he has planned for your loved one by bringing them to be with him. There's no better place to be. Now, we perhaps think it's not a good thing when our loved one dies because we want our loved one to be with us. That's understandable. But for them, if they are a Christian... There's no better place to be. Some of you may know that my dad died by falling off a ladder. Actually, it happened uh, four years ago in a week's time. Now, some people might consider that a bad thing. And in many ways, it is, because we all miss my dad. But for him, it's the best thing that could ever have happened to him. Because he's with his Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. There's no better place for him to be. He's in paradise, never to be sore again, never to cry again, never to get sick again. That is for his good. All things were working together for his good. And what's his good? What's the best thing that could happen to my dad? Is that he is with his Lord and Saviour in heaven. I often wonder when Lazarus was raised from the dead, was he like, Oh no, I was having the time of my death. Remember, Jesus died so that we don't have to. And so while death comes with its own fare of pain and sorrow, while we miss our loved ones, if they're trusting in Jesus Christ, for them, death is not a bad thing. There is no sting in death for them. Because God has worked everything out for their good. And where they are right now is not just good, it's awesome, it's paradise. And God does it for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. I think we get too caught up in this world thinking that this life and this world is the only thing there is. It's not. When we think that way, death is a bad thing. When we think about eternity, then death just brings us into the presence of God. No better place to be. And that is for our good. So whatever God's plan is for you, it will happen. And nothing and no one is going to stop him doing what he's going to do. If you're following Jesus, these plans are for your good. If you're not following Jesus, then they're not for your good. But nothing and no one is going to stop God doing what he's going to do. God planned that Jesus would be executed and that his death would pay the price for the sin of many. And nothing was going to stop Jesus from doing what he was going to do. Not the chief priests, not the religious leaders, not Pilate, not the crowd, nobody. Everyone was working under the sovereign plan of God. Now, Satan wanted Jesus dead, but he didn't realise that he was cutting the wrong wire and accelerating God's plan to redeem the world. This is the hope that we all have if we're trusting in Christ. All because God's plans were not thwarted. They weren't scuppered. All because God's plans were executed exactly the way he planned them. Which means that for you and for me, God's plans for us will happen exactly the way he's planned them. And for those who believe in Jesus, they are for your good, even if they don't appear that way. 
Let me leave you with this quote from a guy called Tom Smeal. The cross that is the outward sign of humanity at its worst, he turns into the altar that is the outward sign of God at his best. Let's pray. Father, thank you that nothing can stand in your way. Nothing can stop you doing what you've planned to do. Nobody and nothing can stop you doing what you're going to do. Thank you that we see that in Jesus' life. Thank you that he did end up dying in our place for our sin. Help us to remember though in our own lives that your plans will happen for us. The great plans that you have for us will happen in exactly the way you've planned them and nothing can get in their way. So may we be encouraged by this great news. It happened with Jesus and it will happen to us if we put our trust in him too. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.